the show. I'm the host, Steve Zeltzer. Tonight we're going to be looking at the history of the uh, California Nurses Association, uh, how they organize uh, among nurses and in the hospitals, and a struggle that has broken out uh, in the labor movement uh, between them and the SCIU. So joining us today is Jan Rodolfo. Welcome to the show, Jan. Thanks for having me, Steve. And you're the secretary of the uh, National Nurses Organizing Committee. That's correct. Okay, yeah. welcome. Now, um, the nurses, the CNA, is a, a very important nurses organization and is now playing a leading role organizing nationally. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk a bit about how the CNA came into being uh, as a kind of proactive union organizing campaign as far as nurses? Okay. Well, the California Nurses Association started out just as a professional organization way back in, in the 1900s and developed into um, an organization that had sort of a professional side and that was dominated by managers and edu nurse educators um, and administ administrators on the one hand and, and then into the 40s had a second wing that was, was about collective bargaining and was about nurses actually at the bedside. Um, and for almost 50 years there was sort of a back and forth uh, tug of war between those two sides of the organization and it came to a head around restructuring in healthcare um, with Kaiser Permanente and, and HMOs really uh, beginning to dominate in the 90s and ultimately we had what we like to call the staff nurse revolution where bedside nurses actually took over the board of directors um, and then eventually we broke with our national body which was the American Nurses Association and uh, we're able to focus a lot more on actual conditions at the bedside and advocating for you know, for nurses and patients. Um, so I mean, the Kaiser Permanente is really interesting because we had an 18-month struggle of um, one-day strikes, I think a total of six or seven of them. Mm -hmm. And um, the American Nurses Association and um, part of the CNA that was management-oriented was actually in favor of restructuring, and that's what the strike was about. And so uh, we had both sides of the organization sort of lined up against each other in some ways there. Now, HMOs, uh, at, uh, when they first uh, came into being in a big way, mm -hmm. uh, were presented as something that was going to be positive and it was going to help people and right. <laughs> it was going to do good things for the people. Right, it was going to bring costs down. It was right. going to bring costs down. And, right. and what, what happened? What was the effect in the hospitals for nurses and, and healthcare workers? Um, the approach of the HMOs was actually to, um, there was a mass wave of layoffs of nurses that happened across the country, um, registered nurses in particular. And there was a move towards sort of taking registered nurse work and, and splitting it up into tasks and then divvy to, divvying it up to new um, classifications of workers. And so you might be you might have been a housekeeper and focused on that and suddenly they want you to do that and do some aspect of patient care. You mean multitasking? Right, exactly. Okay. And that really a speed up in, in a sense. So registered nurses each had more patients. There were less RNs there. And then other um, workers who hadn't been give, given adequate training were being asked to, um, you know, to step in and do registered nurse work. And it, it wasn't good for anybody involved. So this struggle that you had at Kaiser was against that kind of process that was going on? Exactly, right. And what happened? What was the result of that? Um, they actually came at us with really serious concessions. As you can imagine, anytime uh, there's layoffs going on, obviously they say, if you don't want this job, you know, somebody you know, is pounding on our door to take the job from you, and so you don't have bargaining leverage. Um, but with the strikes, and, and we did a good job, I think, of mobilizing the community behind nurses, um, we were successful and actually got all of the concessions um, out of the contract and actually made some improvements instead and really had the first successful strike against Kaiser Permanente. And they've behaved, um, they're sort of the best behaving hospital chain um, out of all of them in California anyway as a result of that struggle. And at the same time in, in California, there was some struggle that uh, the CNA had with the SEIU 250 at that time. Mm -hmm. What was going on uh, as far as that? Um, Southern California was primarily unorganized in terms of registered nurses, but there was a great deal of interest there. And so um, both um, CNA and SEIU were looking to, to nurses in, Cal in Southern California. And the other kind of backdrop um, that was uh, driving the, the conflict is um, that uh, California Nurses Association had been fighting for nurse to patient ratios. So basically the maximum number of patients that any nurse would have to take care of at a time at one time. And SCIU was in a partnership with Kaiser Permanente and so was actually testifying against nurse to patient ratios on Kaiser's behalf along And what were they arguing at SCIU at that time? Um, uh, when they were siding with Kaiser, that they couldn't do it, or what um, was they argument? were yeah, they were arguing uh, feasibility issues. They were arguing that that somehow if you put a set number of, of 
of patients, it was unprofessional. Um, whereas, I mean, the the way that ratios work is it's actually the, kind of the floor. And so the hospitals are required to staff up if there's additional need for, in terms of patient acuity or, or mm -hmm. crisis. Um, and so it, it's, it's got a minimum safety standard, but it also has flexibility. Um, so I don't think that argument was valid. But it was um, really fascinating to watch them sit beside the hospital association and sit beside Kaiser Permanente and actually argue against um, what RNs across the state were, were really crying for. And I mean, this ideology, I mean, what was it that put them in a position where they were sitting with management against the nurses? Um, one of the tenets that happens with the, with the partnership deals um, that, that uh, SEIU is, is the labor management partnerships is I think how they define them, is um, because they're not actually negotiated from a position of strength, um, but rather you're actually going to uh, going to the employer and saying, what would I have to agree to? What, you know, what, what would we have to put into this contract to have it be worth the employer's while to have the union be there and be in this partnership? And so... Is that called interest bargaining too? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you're basically buying the partnership agreement from the employer um, by promising not to do things or promising to do things on behalf of the employer. One of those things is to actually lobby on behalf of what the employer cares about. And so that might look like in the nursing home industry, actually um, lobbying to, def to, to defeat a consumer protection measure that would protect patients. Um, with Kaiser Permanente, it meant fighting against um, you know, CNA strike. It meant uh, actually, in the case of the ratios, getting up there and arguing on behalf of Kaiser on that, and it unfortunately puts kind of a progressive union face on what is clearly a kind of profit-driven management objective. And that's the what's driving medicine and medical care in the United States. Today. Exactly, right. Now, um, this issue of uh, 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 your struggle to get uh, uh, patient ratios, you mm -hmm. were successful. How did you, how were you successful in the legislature doing that? Um, we try. it actually took us uh, almost 15 years to to completely from from start to finish, and we find we're still defending them uh, now. But basically, we um, we moved it through the legislature legislation legislature rather multiple times. Um, didn't get out of committee the first time, and then we worked to put pressure on our allies in the legislature and and or to elect other legislators um, than those that had been voting against us, and ultimately had enough votes. Um, got it onto Gray Davis's desk, um, but it wasn't a foregone conclusion at that point that he would even sign it, um, though we did consider him sort of an ally. <laughs> um, and so we did large demonstrations and-, and uh, To pressure him to sign it. Exactly. He, wouldn't, he didn't want to sign it. No, he didn't want to well, sign it because not? the hospital industry was, uh, was so wholesale opposed to it. And because SEIU was out actually arguing against it, um, I'm sure he was tempted to um, side with one union over another while simultaneously siding with the hospital association. So you were successful, though, in forcing him to sign it. Right. So then we got him to sign it, but then there were, he turfed it to the Department of Health Services to actually set up the, the actual ratio numbers, what's safe. And then there was a long delay in implementation, so we had to get back out in the streets again to demand that they be implemented uh, right away. And eventually uh, it was vetoed by the governor, or, or he put an emergency that was, yeah, Dylan, and then what? Governor Schwarzenegger, um, <laughs> almost immediately after taking office, um, in, I believe, January of 05, there was supposed to be another improvement in the ratios that would go into effect for the medical surgical units, which are the bulk of the units in the hospital. And Schwarzenegger um, enacted an emergency measure that blocked that improvement and um, started a long, a long war between us and the governor. So yeah. what brought about a situation where the nurses really led the rest of the labor movement in saying we're not going to go along with the governor, we're going to fight Governor Schwarzenegger, who at that time was very popular. Um, and you made a, a political decision that you're not going to accept it and you're going to mm -hmm. force the issue. What, what, ha what brought that about? I, you know, I think the difference there was, and we were clearly being told by pl political advisors and by the leadership of other unions that the best we could do was, was sit in a back room with him and minimize the damage. We should come to some kind of agreement with, with the governor. Yeah, and probably compromise. sell out some other group in the process, right? Don't go after nurses, go after teachers instead, or <laughs> something like that. Um, but our board of directors is all rank and file nurses who still work at the bedside. It's a requirement of actually being on the board of directors or being an officer. Um, and so those sorts of cynical, quote unquote, pragmatic concepts don't really fly with our board of directors. And we didn't see why we couldn't take them on. Um, 
because you know we, we politicians do what you force them to do. You know, even if you, if you've helped them get into office or if they're a foe to begin with, it doesn't matter. They actually do what it is that they're forced to do, and so you can't surrender in advance. So you started with the view that you, we have the power and we're going to go after them and use our power. Right. To force and them to do what, what is necessary for really for the nurses and, and health care in California. Right. And then he sort of expanded the attack, the attack to include teachers and state employees and uh, firemen and the widows. Uh, wid <laughs> Pensions. Wid and right. Widows and orphans <laughs> of, of uh, policemen, you know, killed in the line of duty. And I mean, it was, it was like he was going after any group, you know, any of the heroic professions he decided to to go after. Um, and so we kept on doing these demonstrations and really f sort of following him everywhere that he went publicly. And we found that the rank and file members of all those other unions started to show up uh, in force. And mm -hmm. ultimately, the rank and file, I think, um, convinced the leadership w of those unions what was possible. In other words, the CNA led the way in saying you can fight back and this is how you do it. Right, exactly. You so look, we've initiative. had these demonstrations and we're still alive to talk about it. <laughs> somebody else, you know, come out and try it with us. It's and it was encouraging to <laughs> trade unions to see that somebody's fighting back. Exactly. They're not right. going along with, with Schwarzenegger and, and they're ready to stay, uh, stay and, and fight. Right. So uh, now he uh, eventually, what happened with it? Uh, you um, were he, he backed off um, right after the, sp the, s the special election with the ballot measures. And we had that successful, uh, d larger coalition, not just CNA, but, but the whole labor mm -hmm. movement together really pulled together to defeat all of Schwarzenegger's ballot measures. And um, shortly after that, he, he backed off of the attack on, on nurses. Now, I mean, one of the issues that came up is the, his, his public threat to kick the butt of the nurses. Yes. Is that uh -huh. uh, 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 what happens? Is that a reality, the sexism against women, mostly women workers in, in the healthcare industry? Oh, absolutely. I think that administrators um, treat nurses like, because we're, we're primarily a female profession, uh, as if we, we shouldn't have a voice in our own workplace. Um, they, they're liable to say things like, good girl, you know, when you, it's really atrocious um, how that plays out. Um, I think it's in play too with what's going on with SEIU. Um, when um, an employer sits down with SEIU to negotiate on, on how to buy the nurses and, you know, to actually move them as a group into SEIU, you're, you know, I, I don't know that you'd be doing that with a male dominated profession. Now, uh, you decided that the work that you were doing here should be expanded nationally. Right. And when did you make that decision? I believe that was 2004, and um, it started, um, and we've been getting phone calls from across the country for a long time. Who were um, people were excited about what you were doing here. Right, I think the, the Schwarzenegger yeah. campaign in particular sort of shed a national light on what we were doing, and mm -hmm. so the, the interest really you know, built up nationally, but um, there was an Illinois Nurses Association bargaining unit in Cook County, Illinois, which is a key, really key bargaining unit because it's, it's one of the last, uh, other than New York, kind of fully intact public health safety net type systems. That hasn't systems. been privatized and destroyed. Exactly, though they're trying. Yeah, um, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and so they approached us and said that they didn't feel like they had, um, they were being backed up by the INA and felt like they were really under attack from the county and from the city and they needed to stand up and they needed a union that would stand up with them. And so we made a decision um, in the board um, and ultimately in our convention as well um, to expand nationally, and that was the first um, place we looked to. And what happened there? Um, we won that campaign, and so um, that's about 1,800 nurses that became um, part of CNA and the new National Nurses Organizing Committee, which is the national wing. So this national campaign really came out of a real struggle right. to defend nurses in other places. Exactly. And I mean, part of the situation of the unions in this country is that associations or like the, the what was the Nurses Association mm -hmm. uh, uh, try to avoid raiding by joining the AFL-CIO. Right. Has that been a problem or what how does that happen? Um, well we were not part of the AFL-CIO until very recently um, and we're fortunately able to to join the AFL-CIO from a position of strength coming out of out of the the Schwarzenegger fight, mm -hmm. and so we were able to negotiate and make sure that we were taken seriously, and so we weren't uh, we weren't going to the AFL-CIO as a defensive strategy, but instead because we felt like we wanted to be part of the broader national labor movement, and we thought that we had something to add to the debate and um, a model of you know organizing and how to do some political work, um, and so 
Um, whereas prior to joining the AFL-CIO, there were no limitations at all in theory on our ability to raid other unions. Um, joining the AFL-CIO means that obviously we'd, we adhere to um, the ban on raiding and so you have a chapter 20 issues. or something right. of, that rules. Now, yeah. one of the issues that uh, you fought for in California and you're fighting for nationally is single payer right. health care. What, is, what does that mean and why are the nurses taking the lead in fighting for that? Okay. Um, what it means is basically bringing um, the U.S. Uh, to where the whole rest of the industrialized world is, and that is having some kind of universal national health care. Uh, single payer system in particular means um, you maintain a mix of, of public providers in terms of doctors and hospitals and private providers, um, so you're able to choose where to go. Um, but like Medicare, um, there's only one source of payment back to those providers. Um, so it simplifies everything and there's a universal set of benefits that everybody benefits from. Um, and ultimately, we think it means that you, um, when you take the insurance companies out of the mix and out of the equation, um, that you stop seeing the denial of care that happens. Um, you stop seeing choose, people choosing between paying for their medications or, or you know, paying their rent. Um, you, um, you get around all of that, and you also ultimately are able to, to contain costs um, by putting more money into prevention um, before um, people get very sick and show up in the ER. Um, with something that costs a lot more. And also you're able to, to use bulk pur purchasing with the drug companies and So in other words, if they had single payer in California, the state of California would be able to negotiate as a whole group with the drug companies and with healthcare providers. Right, exactly. And uh, the way that, that th the pharmaceutical industry views that possibility is really clear with what happened with Medicare Part D nationally, and that is when the Bush administration pushed Medicare Part D through for you know, prescription coverage for seniors, they put a provision in that actually forbade the, gov the federal government from negotiating bulk uh, prices with, with the pharmaceutical industry to, as to they preserve do in their the, profits. In the Veterans Administration. Right, exactly. Where they can negotiate as a body for all veterans so they get the best price. Exactly. Well, that would hurt a lot of drug companies, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's one of the things I like to talk about. It's oh, it would reduce the incentive to do research, or and the reality is that something like 90% of, of drug company research is actually government funded in the first place. The difference is that the patents actually go to the pharmaceutical industry after the fact, despite the fact that it's public funds on the front end. So they get it on both sides. Right. They get their <laughs> research done for, and then they are right. able to make money off the uh, sale of the drugs. Exactly. Uh, so you began this, you joined the AFLCO, and then you began uh, alongside with that, you began organizing nationally. Right. And uh, we have a, a tape of uh, what happened in Detroit. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't you talk uh, about what has been happening prior to Detroit? Okay. In, in what's going on with the SEIU? Sure. Um, probably the, the main controversy um, that happened in the months leading up until to the Labor Notes Conference in Detroit was an issue that happened in Ohio. And that was um, that there was a, a campaign of, of hospital workers. Um, I'm not even sure I should call it a campaign. Let's say there's a group of hospital workers. And SEIU um, agreed to a partnership agreement with Catholic Healthcare Partners, which was the, ch the hospital chain. It was a wholly non-union chain. Um, and they set about um, a combination of having kind of a corporate campaign where they embarrassed that employer publicly on the one hand, um, but at the same time sitting down and saying, you know, we're hurting you here, but we really could make your life much easier if you signed a partnership agreement with us where we were using our, our force to help you rather than against you. Um, and what they agreed to was kind of a new type of partnership agreement, uh, even more egregious than some of the ones of the past, in that they actually convinced that employer to file the election petition. It's called an RM petition, and it's legal under National Labor Relations Board. And what's unique about it is in a normal campaign to file for an election, you have to have 30% of the bargaining unit signed up on cards. I think everybody's familiar with that. And so there's a requirement that you have a showing of interest. Um, in an RM, RM petition, the employer files a petition and there's no requirement for a showing of interest because it was initially, um, it, it, the NLRB it sort of sits there as a management protection provision. It's, it allows management to call the question if they feel that, that uh, the union doesn't have majority status and it's so it's they negotiate a deal with the union in this case right so what would you have to say to a non-union hospital chain um, mind you they usually spend millions per hospital to actually keep unions out so what would you have to say to them in a back room to convince them that it's in their interest to choose you as the union and to escort you in so so much so that they actually filed a petition themselves um, and 
I mean, we know we don't actually know all of the provisions of that agreement other than the way that the election was to proceed, but the NLRB agreed um, to set up those elections within two weeks of when the, when the petition was filed. There was no mechanism for other unions to intervene. And when we sent a couple of people on the ground in Ohio just to kind of see was there a real campaign there or was this all uh, top-down sort of approach, um, we found that nurses and employees didn't even know that the election was happening. And there's a, actually a nice quote in Labor Notes uh, from one of the SEIU leaders who admits that she didn't know that the election was happening as well. Okay, well, why don't we go to this videotape that we have, mm -hmm. and then we can, maybe you can respond to that. And this okay. is uh, a uh, conference that takes place in Detroit once every two years called Labor Notes of Labor Activists, Union Leaders, and others uh, to mm -hmm. talk about issues in the labor movement. And uh, during this conference, uh, the SEIU sent people in, and we can talk about that after, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of participating in the workshops just dis disrupted some of them and then uh, organized to bring buses to the conference for the banquet. So why don't we go to that videotape. Great. I'm Susan Horn. I'm, I'm Jim West. I'm one of the organizers of the conference. We let you guys come in, you know, gladly to debate the issues. You know, I understand there's a dispute between SEIU and CNA, and it should be debated. It should be fought out. But, you know, then you bring three busloads of people, and you try to force your way through the doors. Diane Feely, who's a worker at American Axle, you know, and she's 60-some years old. She's got blood running down her cheek because your people tried to physically force their way in. Is that any way to not act my, in the labor movement? It's not my people. Oh, no. I well, wish. Who are these people? I wish that I were a member of the SEIU, but I was denied my right to vote for the SEIU union at my hospital, and I was denied by the California Nurses Association. Yeah, but this conference is of trade unions from different places. I mean, why are you picking this conference? Because of, um, of Roseanne DeMauro. Because Roseanne DeMauro, the, um, at this conference, they were going to give her, um, they were going to honor her. And she's a union buster. So we have a conference of people in unions, and they are going to honor a union buster. She busted my right to vote. I am not a union member. I want to be a union member. I have fought for three years to be well, a member well, of the union. Well, the CNA argued uh, that they that this was a rigged vote. It was not a rigged that, vote. That there was only they the SEIU nowhere. on the ballot. They were nowhere to be found. They sent out cards. Are you a nurse? I am a nurse. I'm a registered nurse. Which I work, hospital? I work at Mercy Mount Area Hospital Catholic Health Partners in Cincinnati, Ohio. I came to Michigan because I want justice. And I want to let Roseanne DeMauro know that I am fed up with her union busting tactic. They came to my hospital one week um, before I was supposed to vote for a union. And my fellow, all my fellow employees, from the nurses all the way, all the, all the units, everyone was going to get the right to vote. And this was an agreement that we fought for for three years. The workers fought for this agreement for three years. And the California Nurses Association came to Cincinnati, Ohio, came to Ohio, and they busted our right to vote. They denied me my right to vote. So I am a little upset about that. Because now I don't know how long it's going to be before I'm going to have the chance to negotiate a fair agreement. Do the workers want a union? Yes. The workers want a union. Why don't they union. just form a union? That's what we're trying to do. Now, why do you have to go through the legal procedure? Because our hospital, the um, president,
president of our hospital, Tom Urban, said that we were going to get a union over his dead body. So we had to fight and fight to get our union. We fought him in the courts. We um, talked to all the priests and the nuns. The nuns own the hospitals. We had talked to them. I have been working on this for, for um, three years, fighting for this union. We have been fighting for a union. But we were denied our right. You know, when the first time that we came and tried to organize, they were pulling people off the floor, pulling them into special rooms, showing them videos of why we don't want the, the union. And we do want a union. But they were trying to tear up, you know, our. Um, they were trying to just not give us the right to uh, organize. And so the SEIU fought with us, with us. Did the, did, the SNA, did the CNA try to recruit you? No, no. And if they have not tried to recruit me, then they are really, I mean, how could they miss me? I've been publicized. I'm very vocal. I've been trying to push for this union for a long time. I am no secret in Cincinnati, that's for sure. I have been out there. So if they truly wanted to form a union in Cincinnati, Ohio, they, and at Catholic Health Partners, they definitely would have contacted me. Did they and contact my fellow, any of the nurses? No, they send out cards. No one returned any cards. We did not return their cards. We don't know who they are. We don't even know. They don't even want to unionize us. All they want to do is they want to bust um, SCIU. Why is that? Fight. I don't know. There's stuff that's going on out in California, but you know what? California is California. Ohio is Ohio. And the nurses in Ohio, we want to unionize under SEIU. The reason that we choose SEIU over the California Nurses Association is because we want the entire hospital to have the right to vote for a union, not just nurses. You know, we don't want an elitist nurses union. And so there was a lawsuit over this. And um, Catholic Health Partners lost the lawsuit. And, um, but but SEIU, they were the ones that supported us in this lawsuit. And um, there was a lot of lawsuits. They had to sue them over um, numerous things. And after they kept on losing and losing and losing, finally they were willing to negotiate. So there was no backroom deal. This was a front room deal. This was a grassroots fighting. We fought to get our right to So pay. this was really underhanded in your opinion? Oh, it was totally underhanded. I mean, I've been working for three years. I've, I've spoke at church on Labor Day weekend to a Catholic congregation. I wrote letters to sisters who own the hospital. I spoke to priests. Um, I supported campaigns, political campaigns, you know, because I am a union. I want to become a union member. I'm not. I'm not a union member, unfortunately. But I was denied my right to become a union member by the California Nurses Association. And I really hold Roseanne DeMauro responsible for this because she's in charge. She's the one who chose to have these underhanded tactics at my hospital. What, what happened in the workshop today? I didn't, wasn't there. In but the what, workshop? What, yeah. Well, I just um, talked about uh, my struggle, our struggle at the hospital. You know, because I've been, you know, when you work on something so long and then you're so close, like we were one week away. The agreement was between the um, C, um, SEIU and the um, Catholic Health Partners was to allow us to have two weeks to talk about the issues, to decide whether we wanted to unionize or not, so that we wouldn't disrupt patient care. And it was wonderful. We had one week of heaven. Like I was, I mean, we were talking and debating in the hospital. No management was involved and no union personnel were involved. It was terrific. And then the weekend before, we were going to vote on Friday the 14th, the weekend before, California Nurses Association came to my hospital and they they um, passed out flyers, they um, caught, disturbed our work. They, I mean, they, I had to debate them while I was at work. I'm at work trying to take care of patients and they're in my hospital. They're calling us on our work telephones. They came and they snuck into the hospitals acting like they were pizza delivery. They delivered pizza. And, um, but then what they did is they mailed out these flyers. This is what did us in. They mailed out this, these flyers and they're full of lies. This flyer is full of lies. They brought these to the hospital, but they mailed them to all of our employees, all of my fellow sisters and brothers who want to vote for a union. And um, so is, this is, is the thing that did us okay. in right here because this gave enough doubt and it's all lies. It gave enough doubt so people are wondering, well, gosh, do we really want to join a union or, you know, these unions, what is the deal with them? They're fighting each other. There's backroom deals. There was no backroom deal. The deal was that SEIU fought. They fought Catholic health partners tooth and nail on my behalf on my behalf. They did this for me and they are supporting me today. All these sisters and brothers are here because of me. 
because I was denied my right to vote and all of my fellow employees at Catholic. So you feel there's a betrayal? Oh, I've been totally betrayed by, um, by the California Nurses Association. They have no, there is not any room for them in Ohio whatsoever. If they think that this is the way to win union support of workers for their union they they have got it wrong they have it all wrong and here we were you know on the brink of 8,000 people having the right to vote that is like unheard of these um, unions lately they don't hardly ever get the right to vote I mean it's very difficult for them to win the right to vote I mean you can see down in Texas there's hardly anything going on down there those poor nurses are still not unionized and they're fighting and fighting and fighting and here we are we were one week away one week away and, the, and Rosie Rose Ann, whatever her name is, her name is Roseanne DeMauro. She and the CNA, they came to my hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they denied us our right to vote after all of our hard work to join a union. Welcome uh, back to Labor on the Job. And uh, that was obviously Susan Horn, who was a nurse in Cincinnati. And actually, you were in Detroit at the Labor Notes conference and why don't you talk about what what happened at this these workshops and what were the, what was going on there yeah, um, the morning started with a workshop where there was a um, national nurses organizing committee speaker which was i think labor and politics and we were talking about the arnold schwarzenegger fight and we were talking about the fight for single payer and before um, Jerry Jenkins, who is one of our presidents who was, who was speaking before she could even really get into the content of her talk um, the woman who just spoke, as well as some other um, SEIU staffers, actually stood up and, and yelled at her and chanted that she was a union buster, and union busting is disgusting and, and uh, very disruptive. Um, the facilitator actually just wrote a piece that, that came out today on the blogs about how hard it was for her to keep c control of the room in that circumstance. But um, And that they had had sympathy with some people, uh, other right, arguments, exactly. but, but their tactics kind of... Exactly. And they were actually... Um, I think overall, I mean, the room was really interested in hearing the debate and actually really talking about the issues. Um, and SEIU's approach and sort of heckling wasn't a way to actually have that sort of debate and, di and discourse. Um, but we did our best to, um, to respond to what they were saying, but to kind of try to stay focused on what the actual content of the discussion was and, um, you know, try to ignore it as much as we could. Well, on the issue of single payer, I mean, mm -hmm. getting on that issue, right. uh, in California, although many unions say that they're in favor of single payer, there was an effort to work with Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that all about, that deal with Schwarzenegger? And, and Andy Stern came here and e apparently ignored even the SEIU people in California, the state council, right. and tried to work out a deal with Schwarzenegger. Yeah, there was a, there was a uh, kind of collaboration between um, Fabian Nunez, who's the Speaker of the House, um, and the Democratic leadership, and Governor Schwarzenegger, and then a number of, of large employers. Um, and they backed a, a bill that ultimately was called ABX11. Um, that was the Walmart plan? Yeah. <laughs> it was, um, the, there were many problems with it, but probably the most um, obvious and offensive and, and problematic pieces of it was that it, it included an individual mandate that would require that individuals purchase health insurance. Um, so it kept, not only kept insurance um, companies kind of in the middle of healthcare, but it actually gave them a captive purchasing pool um, while not actually limiting um, what they could charge for costs or what they could not deny in terms of care. So there was no real cost control uh, on that bill right. by Schwarzenegger? Well, we don't believe that, that people are uninsured because they choose to be. Um, we believe that people are uninsured because they can't afford to be insured or because they're uninsurable due to you know, past medical conditions or because the, the plans that they could afford to buy, um, they couldn't actually afford to use in practice because they couldn't actually pay the deductibles to even get to, to the coverage. Um, and what has been the result in Massachusetts where they passed a similar kind of proposal? Um, they, there were sort of estimates up front when that plan, when the Massachusetts plan was being debated before it passed, um, of what the, um, what it would cost for an individual or family to purchase health insurance. And there's something like three times as much now as, as what they initially said. And so, um, they're faced with a situation where they're either going to have to substantially cut the benefits, um, that people receive under the plans, or people are going to be forced to pay far more out of pocket than they can afford. So what you're seeing is individuals choosing to pay the penalties that the actual kind of uh, criminal penal or civil penalty part of it. You put a lien on your your home. Yeah, and that <laughs> <laughs> you, you get it. You take it out of your tax refund or yeah. something like that. Yeah, it has to do with taxes, but there's there's. <laughs> 
there's actually this great slide that Physicians for National Health Plan uh, has that looks at um, what it costs for domestic to be a perpetrator of domestic abuse in Massachusetts or child abuse or child labor violations and all of those fines are actually less than what you get fined if you fail to purchase um, health insurance. Well this whole ideology of, of let the market decide or the, mm -hmm. the insurance companies or deregulate o Cal OSHA, deregulate workers compensation, mm -hmm. what is the net result of that for the working people and the public? I mean, we see more and more uh, uninsured in this country, and people, who, anyone who is insured isn't actually protected from a potential catastrophe or medical bankruptcy because when you actually get sick and need to use your insurance, um, the insurance industry is focused on finding a reason to renege on your plan or actually rescind it after the fact or to find a loophole not to pay you. Um, and uh, or just they hope you'll give up and won't, won't follow the bureaucratic process necessary to get something approved. Um, and I work with cancer patients, and one of the conversations that, that we have with every patient at some point during their can course of cancer is this usually late night thing, the tears running down their face, and they, they say, I'm a burden on my family, and I, maybe my family would be better off if I wasn't here. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's a real soul searching thing that everybody goes through. But I don't believe that question comes up in other countries the way it does here, because that's about uh, medical bills. That's about the cost of, of having a catastrophic illness and, and the fact that you may have to sell your home because of it or literally bankrupt your family. Um, so I, I, you know, that's, a, that's an American phenomenon. The Andy Stern like vision, mm -hmm. if you want, of the need for unions to work with management uh, and, and work out a, a, a solution together. Right. And that, in, that entails, like in the case of, say, Ohio, uh, working with management to have a um, an arrangement whereby uh, there's no card check mm -hmm. and basically what is the net result of that that um, process the net in your view I think the net there's a bunch of results um, in in the case of an actual hospital the net result is that that uh, hospital employees and nurses lose the right to actually advocate for patients publicly because of that may have been a part of the agreement in Ohio? yeah that's a that's a common part of the SEIU agreements is a is a clause that says that the union and its members will portray the the employer as the best place to work and the employer as the best place to receive care so you can't go to regulatory bodies when there's unsafe conditions. You can't do a letter Isn't to Isn't that editor. illegal? No. <laughs> it's, it's you can actually, legal. a contractual relationship in your union contract saying that you can't go to other bodies to complain about mm -hmm. the conditions? Right, so as an individual, you could still, obviously they can't um, prevent you from going um, and whistleblowing or whatever you need to do, but when management decides to come down on you for discipline because of that, you know, your whistleblowing, is your union going to actually stand behind you and actually fight alongside because you? Because you've broken the agreement that right, they have exactly. with the hospital, and that's... And you're a troublemaker from their perspective. Um, right. So they side with hospital management against the person who blows the whistle. Exactly, right. And did that happen in California with this home care um, it, it happens around Ka Kaiser Permanente, um, and I believe it happens around the nursing homes as well. Uh, but any kind of gag clause on a contract like that is just completely unacceptable because we're the last line of defense between patients and the and the medical industry. And um, you know, so you would want to protect those healthcare workers who want to go public and fight for your right, or your, even or even advocate in the moment. So they you're uh, you're you're being like, discharged from the hospital, and and your nurse doesn't think, feel like you're ready, and you don't know where you're going to go, and you're still in pain or whatever. The dumping of patients is that sure. You need you need a nurse who can actually stand up to the doctor or the insurance company or the hospital, whoever it is, who's pushing you out the door um, without you know worrying about retribution. And so one of the beautiful things about being in a union is you can advocate without worrying about retribution, but in this scenario where you have a partnership agreement with a gag clause, it's the opposite. You, you actually have to contend with your union and your employer when you stand up and advocate. Well, do you think, I mean, the Susan Horn is not here. Mm -hmm. We don't have her on the phone or anything, but right. I mean, do you think she's aware of really what's behind this arrangement with the hospital? Or she buys that idea that that's the only way you're going to get a union? Um, I think she seems to buy that that's the only way that you're going to get a union, but it's, it's, it's interesting because um, the claim is that there's been a campaign there for three years, and there there has been, I think, SEIU uh, presence in Ohio in terms of corporate campaign for three years. But one of the phrases she said that stood out to me was when she said, SEIU fought on my behalf. And that really says it. She, she believes, and I think SEIU believe, that they can do a corporate campaign, get this partnership in agreement, as a substitution for actually building a union in the workplace. 
actually building the network of employees, teaching people how to stand up together collectively. And I don't think that you can actually skip that step. And, and ultimately, if you, if you try to skip that step, you don't end up with a union you know, when all is said and done. And What do you end up with? I think you end up with a company union. I mean, you actually end up with potentially kind of an enforcement, another enforcement tool that the, that the employer has to, to actually silence um, workers. And that, that can't be good for employees or for patients. Well, when I was in Detroit and mm -hmm. we shot that video and I did the interview, right. I did meet a, uh, a gentleman who was uh, a home care worker mm -hmm. and he was taking care of his mother. And it turned out that he discovered he was in the SEIU when he got his check and he noticed there was a deduction of $14 mm -hmm. for the dues. He called around to friends, wh where is this $14 deduction? <laughs> right. What is that going to? And right. was found out that you know now he was a member of the SEIU. Is this what we're talking about as far as a union? Right. So what does it mean to be a member of a union if, if it doesn't m mean anything concretely about your, your actual have a, having a say in your, in your work conditions? I mean, that's why people hunger for a union. That's why people come together. And the other uh, piece of it that kind of fits in is that they're doing the, the call center model also in Southern California and other states where instead of having staff members who come to the hospital to help sort of facilitate like business agents or labor reps or whatever you want to call them who help sort of get people organized, um, instead they're giving you an 800 number and saying, um, you know, call the, call the call center to get your questions answered. I heard answered. they're outsourcing that too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. And are, you know, are the phone operators and unionized? Non -union. You got to yeah, wonder, that's right? What, I mean, that's, um, that's, you know, that's just plays into the hands of employers and ultimately it will uh, leave a bad taste in the, in the mouth of any employee who really believes that a union might be the solution. It's gonna, so it'll create anti-unionism? I think so. I mean, you're in that kind of union and it doesn't actually help you and you're paying dues and you don't see anything as a result and you don't feel empowered. Um, what are you going to say to your neighbors about what it means to be in a union and whether a union's the solution? But it seems like that that kind of management labor partnerships, mm -hmm. that ideology is the norm for unions in the United States, that our interests are with the employers and we mm -hmm. have to work out. In fact, when I was in Detroit, there was the UAW American Axle strike, and mm -hmm. the leadership of the UAW was saying we have to negotiate wage cuts and we have to make it more mm -hmm. profitable for the company, even though the company is profitable. Mm -hmm. Is that a real problem in the labor movement? Oh, I think absolutely. This is a debate that has to happen in the labor movement, and ultimately we need to reject this concept of labor management partnerships. I think there are moments in time where you can have an organic relationship where you know with mutual goals. For example, if you're GM, Probably it is in your business interest to actually support single payer, right? Ultimately, manufacturing is getting getting you know beaten uh, beaten in this country by by the rising cost of healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, it's the number one issue in negotiations nationally, number one cause of strikes, etc. Mm -hmm. So you could have a coalition with large manufacturers to actually fight for single payer, but you can't have a coalition with them to fight for something that, that reinforces insurance company profits, right? You have to but actually... But that, I mean, that is a question because, mm -hmm. I mean, these companies are saying that they're uncompetitive mm -hmm. with other countries that have national health care. Right. And some people have hoped in the labor movement that they're going to be foresighted and they're going to do the right thing. But mm -hmm. the experience so far has been that Despite that, they're not really interested in single payer, really national right. health care. Well, there's this talk about l let's get the players together at one table and then we'll figure out what we can agree on and we'll fight for it. The, the problem is when you take that approach and you sit the hospital industry and the insurance industry and pharma um, down together with health care providers and, and Democrats and Republicans, um, you know, you've got players on both sides in, w in one place and, and th the compromised position there is a position that doesn't actually get you to universal health care. And so what you need to do is fight for universal health care and single payer and hope that you can win the argument over time with industry that they should get on board with that effort. But you can't lose sight of what the goal is, um, and that is actually getting insurance out of the picture and actually having single so payer. So removing the insurance industry from health care, from being in control of the health care they system. They, ser they serve no productive purpose. Is that sicko, the film? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have my sicko shirt on. You have your sicko on. shirt on. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, at this conference, I mean, were you surprised I know that they had said that they were might be there and they were kind mm -hmm. of disrupting the workshops were you surprised that they mobilized that many people to try to get into the banquet hall we didn't know what to expect um, we had security there with us just in case and we knew that they had 140 rooms at the Marriott which is a ho hotel nearby and we knew that there weren't that many of them participating in the workshop so we thought 
there was some kind of lar large action coming. Um, what was completely unforeseen, I think, is the violence that happened. I mean, that it, it wasn't a picket outside the, you know, the hotel. Um, An information picket or something right, like that. Right, or something that. like that, which has happened at Labor Notes before um, and which I think, you know, nobody would object to. Um, but it was the getting, you know, having the inside SEIU members open the door and getting into the hotel and the, the kind of punching and scuffling and, and injuries and stuff that happened. Um, were unforeseen. Um, I do have to say that before I even got back from Labor Notes back home, I was in the um, Salt Lake City Airport and got a call from my partner in California saying that there were SEIU uh, people standing on my porch and screaming at her and, and uh, chanting and filming her with a video camera. And uh, so I'm, I'm finding that I'm, I'm no longer surprised by the tactics, um, but that doesn't mean that, that they're not repugnant, not something that needs to stop. So I understand that, that Annie Stern, number one, has said that uh, all the SAIU unions should pull out of the labor councils mm -hmm. because of the rating of the CNA and also uh, that they've shut down their organizing operation nationally and they've sent uh, hundreds of union staffers to California to uh, go to your home and other people's homes right, right. to <laughs> kind of confront you and, and mm -hmm. harass you and your union filed a lawsuit. What is that about? Um, we actually had a temporary restraining order um, issued um, by a by a county judge, um, but it did include Andy Stern, all of his staff, and um, it protected all uh, members of the board of directors and officers for CNA, and as well as our staff, um, because there's a, there was a real sense of threats and intimidation. Um, when they left my porch, they said, "We know where you live, and we'll be back. This isn't done yet." Um, so. So they're trying to intimidate you. Right. I, and, uh, you know, they've got, uh, they don't know us if they think that this is going to work. Um, I think what it's done is really galvanize um, our membership and galvanize our board. And more than ever, we don't think that SEIU is the union that, you know, registered nurses should be gravitating towards. And I mean, this, of course, uh, incident, I mean, one uh, member of the SEIU, David Smith, who's a home care worker, died, right. uh, had a heart attack, apparently was up front trying to push down the door or mm -hmm. push open the door and, and uh, they told the they had kids there children that they brought there right. and apparently they didn't let them know that there may be a confrontation and if they have health problems certainly it's not right. a good place to be if you're going to be in that confrontational situation do you think that was irresponsible absolutely um, you, know, you don't you don't you know gather members on a bus um, tell them you're going to a uh, you know, demonstration and then ultimately lead them into a violent altercation. I don't think there's any way people would have brought their children had they known what was actually going to happen at that action. Um, I think that for the most part they had staff up front. They had some of them apparently had bandanas pulled up over their face. I wasn't right there to, to actually see it, but that's my understanding from accounts. Um, you know, that you don't pull up a bandana over your face unless you're planning to do something that you don't want to be identified for. Um, and so I think they knew very well that they were going to actually push through. Um, and what bothers me about David, the David Smith um, thing, other than just you know s sorrow that that it even happened, is at first that SEIU glossed over it and didn't really talk about it. And now, after the fact, I think that they're actually sort of opportunist and they're using it, uh, using him, um, and actually, in, in fact, even claiming that CNA and NOC. Uh, caused his death somehow. You had and goons, or your own goons, to attack him. Yeah, is that <laughs> <laughs> that's what they're saying, and you know, our staff actually weren't anywhere near even what was happening because they were evacuating us out of the building. Um, so you left when when this incident began to take place. You went into vans and you left the, left right. the premises exactly. along with some cooks. I understand. Yeah, actually, Union some of the cooks. waste staff wanted in the, in the van too. <laughs> well, that was a very dangerous situation. If they right. got into the banquet hall. We were, uh, yeah, we were packed in like sar sardines in the banquet hall. I mean, with the, the tables and chairs were really close together. It would have, I mean, the problem with that kind of action is even if you don't plan for it to be violent, you create a situation where, where you know, at least at a minimum, people getting trampled is pretty much inevitable. And, um, you know, you're so not going to maintain control. So it was a very dangerous control. situation. Right. Well, right. what would bring Andy Stern and the SEIU to cr create or, or bring about a, that kind of, situation which could have led to many deaths and many, mm -hmm. many injuries. Um, I think that SEIU is in crisis. I think that um, that there is more and more pushback in SEIU of Andy Stern's top-down tactics. There's a lot of objection to all of the reorganizing that's gone on um, amongst the different locals and the, and the kind of move away from a democratic union. Um, I know there's an issue with UHW here on the West Coast um, challenging um, 
Andy Stern's practices. And they and filed a suit for the right to free speech. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that um, that this kind of desperate action is not an action that you take when you're feeling confident about your position. I think it's a, it's a sign of desperation. Um, and ultimately, what I think it did was actually expose uh, Andy Stern for you know for what he's really about. Well, what can working people do? It, this is the first time uh, in, in many years, maybe since the 40s, mm -hmm. that you have this open, big confrontation. Now, there was one with the farm workers and the Teamsters, mm -hmm. but since mm -hmm. that time, there hasn't been this physical confrontation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a sign of the times, but also there's, it seems like there's some important political issues right. that are behind what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think the tendency is to think um, you know, the union ma movement is based on solidarity, and it absolutely is. But, and, and you know, you think, why can't we all get along? And there's so many unemployed workers out there. Why can't we just each focus on our own? You know, um, the problem is that to do that would, du would duck to the debate. And we're involved in a labor movement that's in decline, that's, you know, seriously in crisis, that gets smaller with each year that passes. And we have to actually, as a labor movement, come up with a solution for how to, how to actually reverse that decline. And, I think that the, the labor management partnership stuff has actually contributed to that decline. And it's time that we actually rebuild a shop floor, um, you know, type rank and file union movement that actually has the power to, to influence our, you know, our, our own workplaces, but also to actually bring about political change as well. Um, and until we do that, I think we're going to be, uh, you know, a, a smaller group kind of infighting. Um, but I think that this debate has to happen, and so people should look past the sort of initial discomfort. Um, and don't label it as an, as an issue of a tit for tat or, a, or a, you know, turf war or a jurisdictional battle, but really look beyond that to the, to the core issues that are being debated here. Well, there is in California a massive financial crisis. Mm -hmm. The governor has proposed 10% budget cuts, um, laying off public workers, laying right. off, I mean, uh, the University of California having budget cuts, state workers, um, all these public workers in California, there are a million and a half, it seems like, just these public workers coming together and acting mm -hmm. collectively, you could have a fight back, but it doesn't seem to be happening. I mean, no, there is May Day, but mm -hmm. what is it going to take to get the unions really to start mobilizing and, and collectively coming together? Um, I think that that one of the one of the, the the dynamics in place here is that is that people are looking to the political process as a as a solution to the problem as a as a as opposed to sort of the politicians uh, aren't going to solve our problems. I don't <laughs> believe the politicians are going to solve our problems. I think uh, on single payer, for example, the best we're going to get is a president that sort of gets out of the way, hopefully, um, and actually signs something that lands on their desk. But and there's that Conyers bill six HR six seven six six seven six, which would do a single payer national right, sort of Medicare for all type type uh, type of setup. So I think that we need to remember that whoever gets elected, um, that, that we need to hold them accountable, that we need to, you know, affirmative action happened under Nixon. You know, it's, it's not about, you know, who, who's in office, it's about what forces are at work on them. And we know that the, the corporations have, uh, you know, a loud, a loud voice in the Capitol, and we need to make sure that our numbers um, and our unity actually helps to counter that, that uh, monetary voice that's there. Uh, there seems to be, I mean, a system problem. It's not mm -hmm. just the individual, it's not just a party, mm -hmm. but there's a systemic problem where uh, your jobs can be outsourced. Right. Um, all jobs can be outsourced or, you know, with the internet and everything else. Mm -hmm. What kind of change is going to require? I know that the CNA was supportive of the Labor Party, but mm -hmm. what kind of political change or economic change would is necessary to defend working people because there, there's a real decline in their living conditions and standards and their future, I mean, if mm -hmm. they have a future. Well, um, and one of the battles that we've really gotten behind is, is the fight for clean money. It's actually making elections public, publicly funded rather than uh, private donations. Um, we had an unsuccessful ballot measure um, to that effect, but I think that that's, um, that's a, a large step in the right direction if we can make that happen. Um, but, you know, I mean, when did the NLRA actually go into effect? It, you know, it, it went into, the, to, into effect because the, the ruling class and the, the corporate elite believed that it was better to give the working class the NLRA and give them union organizing rights than it was to face the the total upheaval that there was going to happen strikes, as a result. There were general strikes. There was a general um, strike in San Francisco. And so it was. It was in their minds. It was a good business decision, <laughs> right? Because it, it at least preserved their private property and and you know their basic way that the political system was set up. Um, I think we need to we need to obviously there's many steps between here and there, but we need to. Um, you know, be willing to get out on the streets when somebody like Schwarzenegger actually uh, takes on the, the, you know, the public schools or the 
you know, secondary education, absolutely. Well, this history of the labor movement, uh, what we're talking about, history mm -hmm. of the American working class, seems to be lost, though. Right. I mean, the education, when I was talking with that nurse, in fact, and later she, I, she was saying that Ohio is different from California. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do these things differently. Right. And I brought right. up the fact that the Akron yeah. <laughs> strikes and the rubber right. workers, I mean, it has a very militant history of workers organizing. Right. But that seems to be lost, really, in what's going on for, for the SEIU in, in Ohio. Mm -hmm. well, we all have to take it upon ourselves to re sort of dive back into labor history, and that doesn't mean necessarily just curling up with a book. It means uh, it means going going to lectures, and pushing our unions to actually hold labor history lectures and integrate that into the day to day practice. I think many unions don't believe that that there's an interest in labor history, and so it's not part of the normal routine. But we need to make sure that it is because we can't afford to make the same mistakes over and over again. And we've had we have such a rich history of successes. Um, that we can draw on, and we need that more than ever. And the, your union, I understand, has mm -hmm. done some serious intensive education around health care, the health care mm -hmm. system, how right. it's structured, how it's organized. Has that been mm -hmm. useful in educating your members? It's incredibly useful. I think what it means in practice is that when somebody, a nurse, opens their Sunday paper um, with their coffee and they see, oh, look, there's this great new health care reform coming, they're actually able to critically look at it and, and pick it apart and figure out whether it's actually a step in the right direction or the wrong direction. Um, I don't think they were there prior to the education, but I think it, it's, it's about tying um, labor history and political education with concrete experience in the workplace, and, and uh, nurses have lots of examples concretely of, of what's wrong with the healthcare system to draw on. <laughs> okay, well I want to thank you very much, Jan, for coming in and uh, hopefully this debate, this discussion can continue. I think mm -hmm. it's important not just for the CNA SEIU issue, but for all working people. So thanks for joining us tonight. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, thank yeah. you.